This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Hello and thanks for listening in to the very first IBC podcast coming from the Ingeborg Bachmann Center for Austrian Literature at the Ger- Institute of Germanic and Roman Studies at the University of London. My name is Heide Kunzelmann. I have with me the writer and historian Doron Rabinovich from Vienna, who is this year's Ingeborg Bachmann Center writer in residence, and Daniel Wildmann, historian and lecturer at Queen Mary University of London, as well as deputy director of the Leo Beck Institute. Hello, good evening, and welcome. They have joined me <coughs> to discuss the notion of identity, Jewish identity, uh, tonight. Um, and I'd like to just start the discussion off with asking you, Doron. Last week you did a very successful reading at the Austrian Cultural Forum from your recent novel, Andern Orts. It translates as elsewhere. Can you quickly tell us? what the novel is about essentially and why you've chosen that particular title. In the center of this novel is uh, a scientist uh, who knows a lot about other cultures. Uh, He's a social scientist and um, knows a lot uh, of languages. but he doesn't feel at home nowhere. Wherever he is, he is also elsewhere. And wherever he is, he is against the consensus, which is quite um, um, a difficult task because uh, uh, he might say A in one place and B in another place, and he can contradict himself. And he uh, meets another uh, colleague Uh, also an academic, uh, who uh, is an Austrian, and uh, he feels at home everywhere. Uh, He uh, is empathetic with all people. And uh, those two uh, persons um, have a problem. Uh, The one is writing an article, the Austrian, and he's citing an Israeli intellectual, and uh, the Israeli, our main figure, gets furious f- furious and um, and 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 writes an op-ed against him but then it turns out that uh, the Israeli intellectual the Austrian had cited was nobody else but the Israeli himself he didn't recognize his article that he wrote in Hebrew mm-hmm. when he read it in German because the context uh, made a total different text uh, here than there, and his opinion mm-hmm. is uh, exactly the other side round. And they fell fall in love in the same woman. They uh, they search for family and identity, and in a way, it turns out that they might be related. And there is a rabbi who thinks that uh, the Messiah was. Um, murdered as an embryo in the womb of his mother in the Shoah and he wants to um, reconstruct uh, the Messiah with modern genetics, with modern Israeli genetics. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's the, the whole novel is about um, having no homeland mm-hmm. is about the globalized world we're living in is about uh, not having a Heimat as we say in in German and that Heimat is the place or the homeland is the place where you feel the most strange just the strangest you feel the strangest Uh, it's the strangest place in a way this is the place of your childhood because you know everything just too well. And, and, and another, another story here is that family is 
is a place where family is full of secrets and in a way this story the story of elsewhere uh, shows that in this family the secret is what holds the family together mm -hmm. um, well uh, Daniel you have published widely on Jewish identity in Switzerland in Germany in the UK as well uh, you have explored uh, body images with respect to the Aryan ideal of manhood in connection with Jewish gymnasts and you've used the term corporal utopias and we had a quick discussion about the understanding of the title of your book uh, and an odds before. I thought it was expressing some sort of utopia, utopian heimat if you will, but Daniel I think you are not quite <laughs> the same opinion are you? Um, when I read the book, I, I read the book in one go almost, and um, when I read the book about, uh, I forgot about being a scholar and academic, I read the book as a private person, as a Jew, and the interesting thing about that is, um, when I read the book, it was for me not a book about, let's say, about utopias, about fantasies, about wishes, it was for me a book about reality. I recognized very many things, details, discussions, locations, everything was for me extremely real, all the feelings, the emotions, also the movements of the bodies, um, also to, to, to change identities, to swap a jacket and be somebody else. I do this all the time, everybody does it probably all the time, or we do it very often, and also um, not knowing whether to present yourself as Jewish or non-Jewish, it's a very common kind of thing for us. So for me, it was something about realities and not about fantasies or not about, maybe not about wishes and also not about utopias. For me, it was something about which is happening now, today, and about the reality or let's say realities. So you're essentially, you, 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 you've taken up the idea of the writing of today. Uh, Doran, would you say this is your, um, well, it's your most recent book, obviously, uh, and you have been you have been asked whether you write or rewrite history. You have been asked this before, and I think you have you have answered <laughs> exactly the way um, you you were you were uh, expected to, uh, namely that you you cannot really rewrite history. You can you can prolong it and go on writing it in a way, uh, and you said in another essay of yours that literature has means to write about identity problems, about, about the Shoah, about history, in a way science and uh, academia and academic writing never can. Is that still true and does this also, is that also true for, for and an author. First of all, more true for the other books you've written. Before. Yeah, it's it's true because literature has the possibility to write about our language and to write and work in the language. Uh, that's one reason. The second reason is uh, it doesn't have to give an answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it, and that's that's very good. Yes, it it's is. a good thing. You can you can uh, you can just uh, um, ask yourself again and again and uh, and it is much more important to pose the right questions and go after them um, and I think that uh, it's this diasporic uh, mm. feeling that uh, that you can meet in the book um, and and diaspora is is in this book not always something positive and we will we as in, in our in our mm, layer of society we can say well it has a lot of possibilities to live uh, in various cultures and to put on a ja jacket or a pullover and to feel some to be somebody else for some moments for some hours um, to change identities to feel that we are we have not only one identity for somebody who's who's driven out of his country. It's a total, totally different story. Uh, and this is, this is also part of the globalization. 
And so, so mm -hmm. the only utopia, by the way, that I think that I can now, mm -hmm. when I when I look into the book, that I can see, is 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 the is the is the the other human being. The other human being, just the the, the possibility to meet uh, one another. Uh, but <clears throat> but I. But I, I think that um, what I wanted to sh show were people that I know mm -hmm. and the lifestyle, and by the way, not only the Jewish people, but something that uh, is a general um, feeling. Uh, people that I know that are at home and not at home in several countries and uh, who who ask themselves the same questions and experience the same experiences the book is extremely political right it's really highly 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 political because it's also a book about trust and the book about um, acting right and these two terms are related to each other I mean our generation, we started our topics, um, mm -hmm. third why, Jewish, Jewish identity, for we had some kind of reasons why we did this. We could have started something else as well, let's say French history in the century. No, we choose to do something which is very close to us, to our story, for political reasons, because we wanted to change something. But to change something means also to become a political person, to, be, to become a political, a public intellectual or public Jew, so to speak. And this doesn't work if you can't trust somebody. And it's very difficult for us um, to trust because sometimes your colleagues turn out to be difficult. <laughs> mm. Just because somebody's left doesn't mean you can trust him. So Just so because somebody is right doesn't mean you can't trust him. It's much more complicated when it's about um, Jewish topics, Jewish issues. And this book um, really questions all these problems. And um, that's also the advantage of literature. Certain feelings, certain emotions, certain problems of trust are very difficult to discuss this as an academic in a scholarly book. But you can do this here much more open and much more risky. When you speak of trust, um, are you speaking about trust in, in on a personal relationship level or on a professional level, or is it is it about trust in, in general? As a it's both. You know, when you are a, a public intellectual as a Jew, then um, you don't want to be confronted with anti-Semitism. And if you go into a coalition with colleagues which who are not Jewish, you only can do this when you feel safe in terms of I can trust him, I can trust her. She is, she will, he or she will support us. There will never, we will never come across this kind of very awkward moments when suddenly a disagreement is based on anti-Semitism, so to speak. That's really one of the main problems on the continent maybe also here. And this also has an impact on the private life. Oh. Most, of, most of us we have, we fell in love with somebody who's not Jewish. <laughs> yes. <But> <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you would agree. <laughs> yes, it happened. <laughs> How could it? <laughs> well, um, uh, the truth is that that there is a if, if you if you are a, uh, let's let's suppose you are a Jewish intellectual <laughs> and a Jewish <laughs> and universalistic person, um, that that makes that makes you wonder um, how to how to uh, live this universalism um, because there is a certain tradition of non-Jewish universalism uh, and you know this this typical this uh, this universalism that comes out of the Occident and comes right away from St. Paul uh, is not universalism that is equality for or is, is a promise let's say it like this for all the people 
uh, if they are ready to to be with <laughs> with with There's us. Always an if. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you have to you have to. This is a universalism for the converts, right? The Jewish co universalism fun functions in a different way. And it's a universalism of a particular kind, <laughs> because uh, it doesn't. It, this diaspora feeling is always aware that there are a lot of minorities, and this is a thing you wouldn't believe it if you see some factions in Israel today. But nevertheless, this was the experience of Jewish diaspora and Jewish history. And it is also uh, of some Israeli faction still that you have a universalism of minorities, not of one majority, not. and uh, and and Jew a Jewish universalism normally tends to over-identify with the people you want to fight for and to fight with, and. In the moment when you are then confronted with anti-Semitism, and that is an experience that most, if not all, of these persons make, this is this is the shock. Uh, because first of all, you tell yourself it's not me they mean, <laughs> but I tell you something: it's exactly you they mean, and um, so. This is this is an experience that um, has to do with that what you explained about trust and mistrust. It's probably a question for for every minority there is in in th there are lots of different minorities everywhere and uh, you you think you are outside of it and then you aren't. How how important is it? I mean, as an academic, you are structurally outside the topic anyway or some some way some sorts as a writer you have a distance to the topic but then again you don't H how important is it for you as a writer to be outside of it all to have a distance and to, to actually have a distance to the questions that preoccupy you and bother you is it necessary at all when you write or when you when you devise a new a new story a new well the distance and and um, also the involvement is maybe defined by the language because mm -hmm. um, because the German language makes it a question of distance and a question of involvement uh, at the same time mm -hmm. um, and you cannot uh, evade from the topic. It's impossible because if you write, as Doron Rabinovich, a story about Edelweiss, uh, <laughs> they will say it is a Jewish story about Edelweiss. You didn't have that in mind, but it is the way a lot of people will read it. So, uh, and you know, with Doron Rabinovich, with this name, it's it's even much stronger than with other names. Uh, when I said when I when I uh, uh, said what's my name in a in a youth party, um, we did not have any problem what to talk about anymore for the next hours. Uh, the Middle East and uh, the Shoah and Austrian history and anti-Semitism and uh, you uh, all that. So. Um, so it is clear that uh, my stories had to confront that. I had to be aware of that. Um, and nevertheless, I have the freedom to say, I don't want to write about this topic. I could say that. So it's my choice that I did write about that in other words. But the way I wrote it in this novel, I think, is not just a Jewish way, it's a way that also reads, also is relevant for, as you said, uh, other minorities or other groups, or uh, for just human beings. It's very similar for me, also as an academic, as a scholar, I'm, never, I'm, I'm always 
part of the research, mm-hmm. and always part of the problem, so to speak, and never out. And the, and the question is, how do you cope with this? And Don writes a lot about this in the book, and um, I try to cope with this kind of problem by analyzing, using methods, using a lot of theories. But with theories and methods, you can be very harsh, very brutal. You can decide, you can decode something, mm-hmm. you can destruct something, you can destroy certain things. So for me, the main issue is now, I have written about Jews, I have written about Nazis, I have written about anti-Semites. Or in other words, really differently, I have written about friends, I have written about foes. And I prefer to write about foes, because with friends, I'm very reluctant you know, to bring to work with methods and theories. I don't want, I love them, I don't want to distract them. Mm. So mm. I prefer to write books about my enemies. Then I, then I think I can really be a good scholar. Uh, Doran, you said uh, you should, one shouldn't be able to write with Geisteskälte about a uh, topic that well, engages you in, mm. in, in, in such a profound way. And I'm absolutely with you, and you, this is exactly what you, Daniel, just said. Uh, there is no way we can disengage completely from our to- and we should not disengage from our topics at all, especially if they are as important as identity and as such. Um, you've also, Doron, you've also said, uh, littérature engagée is sometimes used not or very often used not in a very nice way mm-hmm. um, now would you call your books engagierte literatur literatur engagée in a way is there some sort of I- engagement well i think that um it's more complicated with me because um uh, i did not become a writer because I'm politically uh, active and because I want to take can you say to, to raise my voice yeah, mm-hmm. and to take the word can you say mm-hmm. to take the word no I, I was taken by the word this is the reason why I'm a writer but as a as a as a citizen <laughs> I'm I'm uh, somebody who is active and uh, politics is uh, topic for me and it would be uh, also as an historian or as a physician or as a a carpenter it's not important and one reason why that is so is I think also my family history I'm sure because um, the lesson of our family history is you have to watch out Trust issue coming exactly coming back. You again. have to watch yeah. out, and uh, this is this is a topic throughout Jewish uh, uh, culture. Uh, the question of remembering is uh, beware of Amalek, beware of of the foes, of the enemies, and uh, so um, well, it's 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 not lit. It's not literature literature engagé in that sense that I am writing for a political faction or for a political ideology. It is, um, but it is something that is uh, knowing the place. And I have to tell you, I know I know what my stories. Well, I I I don't write all the stories without asking myself where do they go to I know that there are writers who say I had to change the story because the figure in the book told me that I have to take this turn Um, well in my stories I know exactly who has to say it's not the figure it's me I'm the one who's writing it and yes there are certain stories that don't work that's true then I have to think it over. But nevertheless, the responsibility lies with me. And the authority. And the authority lies, lies with, with me. You. And um, I cannot, I think this is, this is the, 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 the difference to, uh, the, uh, to all that what is said about literature engagée. Um, the story and the language 
and and the literature has to be good, has to work, and uh, and yeah, it, it's not. It, I, I I think uh, everything else would be a dictatorship of ideology, and this is this is not what I. Well, it has happened before, hasn't it? There yeah. are sure. loads of books right. that actually subscribe to that idea. Yeah. Um, we had a we had sorry that no, we had a no. slogan in we had a slogan uh, in the year two thousand against the coalition with Jörg Haider, and the slogan was I say it first in German, die Kunst der Stunde ist Widerstand, um, and it's a play with words because normally you say die Kunst der Stunde, mm -hmm. but uh, but but it means die Kunst der Stunde means the art of the hour, of the time, the art of the time is resistance. And in this moment, I think uh, this is the moment where, where uh, uh, and, and the art uh, is perceived in a different, very much politi more political way. And it has uh, a different audience. But normally it transcends this audience and it has much more meaning if it's really good art. Mm -hmm. Because art is not, a, is not a guarantee for quality. I mean, surely what we said at the reading, surely this, this a lot of in Andern arts resonates not only with Austrians, obviously, although it, is, it has some very Austrian aspects, not only language-wise, there are some words in there that make it uh, an Austrian story, if you will. Yes. At the same time, uh, we had this discussion before, or at the reading, it came up that the reception in England, for example, uh, would be similar, similarly good, if it was translated, and we hope it's going to be translated in full. Do you have any, are there any plans for Tess Lewis to, it has, it has well, Tess is great, and she's she's uh, searching, but cool. I cannot. I cannot be. <laughs> well, hopefully there'll be a translation of Andernauts elsewhere. Is probably going to be yes. exciting soon. Uh, it will be interesting to see what the reception in Britain or in English-speaking countries would be. Do you have any? It's very difficult to tell because first of all, um, there's no dawn here in the UK, right? Not yet. I'm not quite sure whether there will be, because um, Dawn is, a, if I may say, not only a, a think and a writer, also public intellectual and public Jew in Austria, and this is something unheard of in the UK. Whenever I go to a dinner party, then I'm confronted with certain kind of um, no-go eras, taboos, certain yeah. things you don't discuss, like, for example, politics or religion. But what do you do when you work in my field? As, a, after as a historian, <laughs> and politics, especially when you work on Jews, yeah, anti Semitism, yes, and Nazis. You know, so when people ask me, what do you do for a living, Daniel? Oh, an academic, blah, blah, blah. What are your research questions? I say, okay, Jews, Nazis, anti Semitism. <laughs> Discussion stops. And we have to talk about the weather. And after 10, 20 minutes, we come back and take a little bit more Jews, Nazis. But always is some kind of uh, awkward moment, which has nothing to do with anti-Semitism, but it has to do with certain topics which shouldn't be discussed at a, at a dinner mm -hmm. or, let's say, um, at certain events, because I was afraid that maybe somebody will be annoyed or something like that. And um, therefore, and also, I d there, and, and I think um, English jewelry very much wants also to blend in. And this goes against the idea of a public Jew, a public Jew, a public intellectual like Dorian also doesn't want to blend in. You know, you want to change something, you only can change in if you don't blend in. If you say that's not right, we have to do this differently. And um, I think that's an idea which is very unfamiliar here for several reasons, partly with certain topics, partly also because British jewelry has a different understanding of society than, for example, Austrian jewelry or German jewelry or Swiss jewelry. And therefore, um, it's very difficult to foresee or to, to see what kind of interpretation 
how will how will a British audience read the book, right? Do they also see the kind of public Jew part of it, the Austrian Jewish history part of it? And um, in my case, it's always part of my history. I'm not Austrian. I'm I, I'm. Swiss, German, Polish Jew, but it's still part of my history. And also these actors um, and, and the figures here, the main characters, are also part of my history. Public academics were fighting for a cause and having many different, different relationships. But um, does the British audience can read this? Maybe they see it, um, other things very interesting which I don't see which also probably can enrich our understanding of this brilliant book, well done. But of <coughs> course it will be very different here than, let's say, in the German-speaking countries. Well, it certainly will be a question of the right marketing. Uh, sure. Surely they will market it differently than they market it in Austria or in Germany, um, when Surkamp uh, knows what they're doing in Germany. I was just thinking when you said there's no public Jew, there is something like a public German every now and then. You know, that probably that concept of a public German in Britain would work uh, Are there public Germans in Britain? Um, I mean, well, not, not that I know of, not in that way, but the idea of Germany and Germanness is so much ingrained as a kind of, uh, uh, it's there for public, it's up for grabs for public discussion, what it is to be German, how German are you, that this is, this is what, what uh, the British public concentrates to a certain degree. Am, am I the completely mistaken or...? Not completely, but my point was more that there are a lot of Jewish intellectuals that scholars here, but when they are in the public sphere, yes, they them. are there as filmmakers, as academics, but not as Jews. Mm -hmm. While in Austria, Switzerland, Germany, we are out there as Jews, if we want or if we don't want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And that's, that's a very different um, 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 situation. That's a completely... Yeah, obviously it's not. It cannot. It cannot be compared uh, culturally. It's just in Austria, it's like that. Um, even if what I say now is not maybe the opinion of a lot of Jews or a lot of Austrian non-Jews, um, but nevertheless, I would say that after the laws of Nuremberg, um, there is a division between who's a Jew and who is not a Jew in Austria. And before the laws of Nuremberg, the Jews, mm, in their majority, wanted to be Austrians. And the Austrians, all of them, the Jews, Jewish or not, thought they were Germans. But the, the, the Austrians, the, or not all of them, but let's say two-thirds of them, uh, um, the Austrians said, more or less, the consensus wa was uh, you cannot be an Austrian unless you assimilate, but you cannot assimilate because you're Jewish, and you can try, but it won't work. And the Jews didn't understand that. And after 45, the situation was, interestingly enough, vice versa, because uh, the Jews came back and the Austrians said, well, you come back and now we are all Austrians. And the Jews said, no, no, we are not all Austrians. We are Jews with a special history and you proved it to us. And we speak about it. And the Austrians said, no, 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 we are all Austrians. <laughs> <laughs> so the situation really changed. The situation really changed. And, and um, so the, the question, if somebody is Jewish or not, is of importance in Austria, even if it is not, if if it is not spoken out, there was a famous example of somebody who did not speak about his Jewishness and said he's just an Austrian, and he was loved by the Austrian. That was Bruno Kreisky, mm -hmm. and Bruno Kreisky was seen as a proof that, um, well, there is no real Jewish people. Uh, after all, Bruno Kreisky says that, and he must know because he's one of those who is not. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was quite funny and and, and <laughs> dialectical, and and um, 
but but today uh, even even this position would not be possible anymore today uh, we have uh, we have a, a, an, an awareness since I would say Kurt Weidheim mm -hmm. about this past and about Jewish identity and um, so this situation is totally different than I suppose here and uh, and I'm quite astonished that you say that you cannot speak about it in a small talk I'm talking about dinner when you invite mm. to a dinner certain topics are taboo but for everybody mm. the problem is only we as professional Jews if religion is a topic which is everybody's afraid of talking about because somebody can be annoyed or insulted and you don't want that at the dinner, right? But what do we do then? <laughs> right? Because we love to be a professional Jew, we love to speak about this. It's it's our mission, so to speak. That goes why without eating. Yeah, it, it goes, goes with, without with, eating. With, with, without eating. <laughs> and, and, and this is just very different here. For example, the love story in, in your book, Doron, plays also with Jewish Gentile opposition, um, the flirt, and he he plays a Gori, yeah. and she plays a Jew who doesn't know that, I mean, who plays his game, but the, the big thing is about between the two that maybe one of them is not Jewish. She, she calls him when they have sex with a German name, not with his Jewish name. And that's, that, that's something which doesn't work. I've never come across something like this, that um, erotic or sex between Jews and Gentiles, Jews and non-Jews, in German-speaking countries is very loaded, has a special kind of um, fascination, very many fantasies around this. Um, but this has to do with the past, with the history right and mm. um, but this is unheard of here mm -hmm. it has not this kind of explosive ingredients as it has on the German speaking continent there's another topic though that has more meaning here maybe than in Austria and that is this Israeli yeah uh, yeah, side yeah of absolutely the story. yeah because um, He's quarreling with his Austrian colleague about the past, about Auschwitz, not about Israel. But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, although I did not, I did not uh, go after that discussion, but after the past discussion, in reality it is clear that this story also is always relevant. And that is something that I think you do not only have in Germany and mm -hmm. in Austria, yeah, right. but you have it also in the United in the United States right. in a different way. You have it in France in a totally different way because uh, what is going on in Paris mm -hmm. and uh, and the discussion between the Muslim society or the North African society and 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 uh, the the Jewish North African uh, or Ashkenazi society. So um, and then in a different way you have it in Britain. I say that as somebody who re reads newspapers, mm -hmm. not as somebody who who has experienced it. But that could be a topic that um, that is interesting. For a new novel? No, I mean for somebody who reads the old one. Uh, this would be just uh, an idea. Yes, you're absolutely right because um, newspapers are very outspoken and I think politics in the Near East is some kind which is discussed here very often. I'm not quite sure, not so sure about dinner table situation because politics is mm. also something which you better don't touch it. But I think I do agree that um, this might be a source of fascination. I use the term fascination because I think anti-Semitism works here very often. We are politics in the East, right? Mm -hmm. And the extremely fascinating thing about Dawn's book is it touches on topics which are contaminated like the body of the Orthodox, right? And, um, but it's not anti-Semitic, right? Usually when somebody writes about Orthodox, about the smell, about sweat, 
very soon becomes very anti-Semitic. If somebody writes about um, complicated relationships in Israel between Jews and Palestinians, between Israeli, Jewish Palestinians and, no, Jewish Israelis, <laughs> this was a Freud. <laughs> <laughs> Jewish Palestinians between Jewish Israelis and, Palest and well. Palestinians, Israeli Palestinians, yes. Palestinian Israelis, then um, s very soon it turns, it can turn into something highly problematic, if not to say anti Semitic. That's never the case in Doron's book, and um, there's very many reasons why why it's not the case. And therefore, I think it, 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 it might be very fascinating, and I speak with, I play with the double sense of this word, for local, for British audience to see that you can write and speak about such topics, mm -hmm. even about the sweat of an Orthodox Jew, without without doing it in an anti-Semitic way. And also talk about these problems, about problems you can't solve, about questions without no answers, without being um, an anti-Semite. Two things come to mind. The first one is uh, humour. I was thinking of the scene when, when, uh, when uh, the main character is confronted with the Orthodox Jew in the plane, mm -hmm. uh, where all this is being described, and you resolve it with a certain amount, quite a big amount of humour in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. The tension actually is dissolved because, uh, because of the way you describe the whole, the whole scene. Um, and the second one is questions, but let's get to humour first. How important is humour for this book, for your work in general? You said Andan Orts, uh, was uh, received as your most funny, your funniest mm. <laughs> book so far? How, how important is it for the other? I think that um, humor is important when it makes us more clever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'm not interested in humor that is just, uh, uh, just laughing about mm. the other and uh, just laughing away problem uh, this is not nothing that uh, that uh, is is good humor good humor is to show us where the uh, line is where, where where the breaking where the where the rupture I think the word would be rupture maybe huh? where the rupture is where the front is and uh, and that that is that is uh, weapon that, that is a weapon that's that's a possibility um <coughs> and yeah i mean um i'm 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 happy that it is uh, <laughs> that it works as humor um and some of the some of the s scenes that i had in this uh book were also funny to write, uh, but they are also very sad ones, you know, right? And I have to tell you that even, even knowing <laughs> what's going to come, I knew already the next sentence. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was sad to write it. But yeah, but uh, the funny, funny uh, parts uh, when I wrote them were were also fun for me. And nevertheless, um, it took quite a time to find those, uh, to, to invent some of those jokes. And, um, and I think that, that the possibility is also to have humor that doesn't make you laugh, um, but to have also humor that, um, that is not, that, 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 uh, just, <coughs> um, Swaps you, sweeps 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 you sweeps away uh, yeah, but but you cannot laugh about it because mm -hmm. it takes away your breath, mm -hmm. and and that mm -hmm. is that is also good. I like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like you that. You mean in a negative it. sense, or it yeah. takes away your breath? Yeah, it takes away my breath in a grotesque way. way. I mean, uh, I, I like that in films. I like that in books, uh, and I don't have to laugh along all the film, all the book, um, mm. but it's, it's, it, it's, it's very beautiful to have a comedy 
and not to have to laugh all the way through mm -hmm. but suddenly to see that's another humor and here's another thing that we can understand and it, it wears off if you do it too often it just yeah. wears off in a way and uh, well um, this was this was at least what I tried to do with the book Dorian is really right about this about the book is utterly funny mm -hmm. but it's always um, linked to rupture to fissures right and and this goes back to what, to what Dorian said before about a special kind of universality Jewish thinking or ideas about universalities these this kind of thing is always linked to ruptures to fissures for us it's not about homogeneity homogeneity mm -hmm. no it's about not being homogeneous that's the way of universality we um, we would like to um, be envisage. So you have a plurality of minority, if you will, a plurality, very, very, uh, yeah, as opposed to orthodoxy. That's yeah. Uh, yeah. The, 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 there are two poles. No, no it's or, about or it's even? about not being homogeneous. It's about answer of problems. It's about open questions. Mm -hmm. It's about fishes. It's, it's it's about to live with tensions. Yeah, that's 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 a very uh, good thing. I I think um, to have certain problems that you can live with, mm -hmm. exactly. and you cannot solve them maybe, but you can live with them. Um, and to know that there are certain ethics, but you cannot always. Uh, you can always <laughs> fulfill <laughs> what <laughs> what is imposed on you, <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, you know what 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 happens. You don't you don't uh, say that everything is glory and wonderful, uh, and that's that's a good. These are good circumstances for humor. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I have to tell you that uh, the Austrian past and the Austrian history. Uh, has sub has a possibility for good humor because um, because <laughs> <Certainly>. <laughs> you know, at least for <laughs> irony I mean uh, uh, the history of of a country that has uh, had so many systems so many authorities in the last hundred hundred fifty years and one system contradicted the other one. Uh, that makes you quite ironic because iron uh, irony in it in its sense means that you says say something sorry that you say something uh, and you mean something different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and that's something that happens quite a lot in such an, in such a, with such a past um, so so yes it's it's also it's by the way also an Austrian humor and an Austrian possibility and this is something that is quite interesting if you come to Austria literature um, Austrian literature has has this uh, quality I don't say that uh, all of us have the same humor and I don't say that all of us uh, have uh, good humor or all of us have humor but there you f you can find it in 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 some of the great works and uh, and I think sarcasm and irony is there I'm I'm not I'm not as you uh, a, a scientific uh, expert no. but I would say Bernhard or Jelinek would be good examples oh that. very much very much so that you have you have long traditions of, of sarcasm they might even be longer than than any other tradition you have irony there starting in uh, the 17th century already and coming up. Uh, these days, uh, it was um, last week, and Johann Nestroy, it was his 110th, the anniversary of his, his mm -hmm. death, has uh, well laid the base for yeah. a certain kind of irony right. and humor that is, that is still valid up to now yeah. and is, is still there in literature. Um, speaking of Austrian literature, you have been already, I think, 
to some way put into a kind of category. You've, you've, uh, it's a new tradition, and they call it new Jewish writing. Are you happy with um, with that label, <laughs> uh, with being one well, of the few who have actually have actually I think that open this category? I think every lab every label will be something that every writer or most writer will say writers will say uh, I don't want to be put into this uh, I want to be more but on the other hand I have to admit that I'm ready for all the labels if uh, <laughs> I don't take okay. that too <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't have too much problems still maybe actually but, uh, but I would say that uh, one thing is true. Um, this is a f my writing is an Austrian, is a Jewish, is a, is is a German too because it's German language, German, and it's also in a way a little bit an Israeli writing, mm -hmm. Be and it's all together, and it's sh certainly also European because I'm influenced by mm -hmm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm who are living in Vienna and a lot of people are living somewhere else and a lot of people are living by the way in Tel Aviv uh, and uh, writers too and um, I, I read the first chapter before before it appeared in, in, in Israel in Haifa and uh, <coughs> and another writer um, asked me in the audience she asked me um, are you afraid that your jokes about this Orthodox Jew, mm, I love this chapter, but don't you think it could be perceived anti-Semitic in Austria and in Germany? And I said, no, I don't think so, because um, the way it is written, uh, it's not possible, because you make fun about all the sides, and it's quite clear in which head you are. So I think, no, I don't see that. Um, and then another lady, one of those who are called Jeke, the old uh, Jewish German uh, who came who came to to Palestine in the thirties, um, she raised her hand and said, "This is for her a Israeli book written in German, <laughs> which I don't say that it's true." <laughs> But I think yeah. you can see it like that too. So it's another label. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what is also true is that there is some kind of miracle. You have not many Jews in Austria. We speak about 8,000 Jews in the Jewish community and maybe 15,000, 14,000 Jews in Austria, if you also sum up all those who are not in the community. So, not many Jews. Mm -hmm. And relatively spoken, quite a few people who write about the Jewish identity. Um, and not, and, and important Austrian writers, uh, Robert Menasse, Robert mm -hmm. Schindel. You have uh, writing about her Jewish father, Elfriede Jelinek. Um, you had the poet Elfriede Gerstel, Eichinger. Uh, well, that's. Uh, you have now Wertlieb. Mm -hmm. Now, just imagine you have the essayist Ruth Beckermann. It's unbelievable. This is really unbelievable. And the interesting thing is that. Um, that it has something to do with the, with the Austrian tradition, with the Viennese tradition, Jewish-Viennese tradition, and it has something to do with um, the many decades uh, when Jewish identity was suppressed in the official Austrian historiography. Uh, histori historiography. Um, and, but it's a miracle nonetheless. It's interesting. Uh, Yulia Rabinovich, I, I forgot, yes, I forgot uh, uh, another one. So um, that's and quite that, interesting. And there'll be more. 
there are important yes. voices and they, yes. they, they become more and more which is actually a miracle as you say it is it has been noted and it's it's really great yeah and you know there's an interesting uh, thing I mean we do not have correct me if I'm wrong but I think we do not have so many still still so many Turkish Austrian or Austrian with Turkish family background uh, writers uh, or Bosnian but maybe maybe that's that I am not sure because because I I'm, I'm, I'm not sure always where somebody really comes from mm -hmm. but uh, but this is something that you have in Berlin you have it in Germany so there are certain mysteries <laughs> questions that we can ask without having the answer uh, how come but there is there is a certain yes there is a J certain Jewish writing in Vienna in Austria well um, part of my writing is 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 in that and and but I but I want to say that there is a part that is not there. It goes beyond. Yeah, for me, it's very clear. Yeah. Um, well, we've we've got uh, time for one last question, and um, I've I've got a, I've got one that interests me um, very much as well. Do you consider yourself as someone who's building bridges? Anyway. I mean, both of you. This goes to both of you as as an academic uh, and as a writer or is it more a severing of, of, of no probably not what, what, severing a, uh, the cutting of bridges cutting of bridges in one way it depends if you ask me as a novelist or an essayist or a Let's say a novelist, as a novelist. As a that, novelist. Is that a... Well, I don't... Uh, these are not the reasons why I write the stories, but, uh, but I think that the stories do both. They cut bridges and they build bridges. Because um, in the novels, certain stories are relevant which some people do not want to talk about and that burns down some bridges and I, it's okay with me um, and it doesn't have to be an Austrian or a non-Jew that I speak about, not at all uh, I'm quite sure that um, somebody who is um, right populist Israeli wouldn't like that book and uh, as I say um, that's okay with me I mean uh, I, not everybody has to like that book uh, on the other hand I think that for people who think that the utopia is in the other one uh, in the other human being and, and, and are open and, and open to these stories at least uh, uh, and interested in elsewhere <laughs> uh, yeah I think for them such stories can be bridges I hope so <laughs> it's a difficult question mm, I would say my institutional uh, back in Institute London they certainly we certainly build as an institution bridges between let's say the German speaking academia and the, academic, the academics within the Anglo-Saxon language world. Now, me as an author, as an academic, as a writer, do I build bridges? I like to question things, right? I like disagreement. Maybe I like to hurt, even. So very often I burn bridges, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's what I really like, to question things. And um, whether you call this building a bridge or not, that's a different question. If building bridges about harmony, I'm not building bridges. 
I like the question. So we've got the burning, burning bridges here, and then the ongoing questions in your novels. The question is, as I've noticed, uh, intrinsic. It's no. productive, but it's 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 really central to. Yeah. We have a quick talk about the central to your work, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so burning bridges can be very productive. Can be very productive as well, indeed. And can open up new views, new perspectives. And you can build others somewhere else. There are certain moments when uh, it's more important to have the divisions than the... Yeah, right. mm -hmm. uh, and and one uh, doesn't have to be afraid. As long as nobody got seriously hurt, mm -hmm. physically hurt, mm -hmm. uh, that's okay. Um, and but, but I don't know how it's with you, Mm -hmm. yeah, but but with me, I think that I'm interested in the story, and uh, and that's by the way the same thing with an essay and an article, and a study. Uh, I'm interested in my topic, and I do not ask if it heals or not. Uh, and in in the in, in, in the and the main thing that you can do with words is not to heal wounds but you can shout when it when there is pain and uh, and that is that is uh, that can be very uh, that can be part of of the healing process because somebody <laughs> says that there is a there is a wound mm -hmm. but but that's enough for me I totally agree with Doron. <laughs> yes. Totally, fully. That's also how I understand my way of writing. I fully, fully, fully agree with Doron. So do I. I think this is a perfect way to actually stop, stop here, and a, and a, and a very strong picture, and a visualization, visualization, visualization. Sorry for what we've done today. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank for you. The conversation to thank both you of very you. Thank you much. And good night. Mm. <laughs> Probably yes. Good night. <laughs>